Chapter 24, An Affluent Society, 1953 to 1960, Part 1 and 2. Part 1. In 1959, the United States and the Soviet Union exchanged national exhibitions giving each nation's citizens a chance to learn about life in the other. The Soviet exhibition in New York City displayed factory machines, scientific advances, and other signs of the ways that communism had modernized an undeveloped country. The American exhibition in Moscow displayed consumer goods, including stereos, a movie theater, home appliances, and 22 cars, all to show the superiority of modern capitalism and how it embodied political and economic freedoms. But the exhibition's most important message was the conflation of consumption and freedom. At Moscow, Vice President Richard Nixon celebrated America's high standard of living and its ability to create prosperity for all social classes. The Moscow exhibition witnessed the kitchen debate, unscripted talks between Nixon and Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev about the relative merits of communism and capitalism that unfolded in a model suburban American kitchen. Nixon claimed the kitchen showed the mass enjoyment of freedom in America, freedom of choice among products, colors, styles, and prices. Nixon understood that soft power or the penetration of American goods and popular culture was stronger than military might. His celebration of American freedom, defined as affluence and customer choice within the traditional family life, captured much about America in the 1950s. Khrushchev mocked American consumer culture and Americans' obsession with goods, but his prediction that the Soviet Union would soon surpass America in the production of consumer goods conceded the victory of the American way of life in the Cold War. A golden age of capitalism followed World War II, in which economic expansion, stable prices, low unemployment, and rising living standards characterize American economic life until 1973. In every measurable way, most Americans lived better than had their parents and grandparents. By 1960, a majority of Americans were defined by the government as middle class, and the poverty rate had dropped to one in five families. New innovations like TV, air conditioners, dishwashers, cheap long-distance phone calls, and jet air travel came into widespread use and former luxuries like electricity and indoor plumbing became common features for many Americans. Although the economies of Western Europe and Japan recovered after the war, the United States remained the world's industrial superpower. Major industries like steel, automobiles, and aircraft dominated the American and world markets. And like other wars, the Cold War increased industrial production and redistributed population and resources. The West became a center of military technology production, and the South housed military bases and shipyards. In New England, new aircraft and submarine production replaced some of the jobs lost by the movement of textiles to the South. But the 1950s were in fact the last years of America's industrial age. Ever since, the U.S. economy has moved towards services, education, information, finance, and entertainment, while employment and manufacturing has dropped. Union-led wage raises caused many employers to turn to mechanizing production in order to reduce labor costs. The number of farms in America declined as well, even as new technologies and irrigation increased agricultural production. Changes in southern agriculture continued to reduce the number of agricultural laborers, three million of whom, both black and white, left the South. What most spurred economic growth in the 1950s was housing construction and spending on consumer goods. The post-war baby boom and population migration from cities to suburbs created a demand for housing, TV, home appliances, and cars. By 1960, there were more suburban residents of single-family homes than people living in urban or rural areas. In the 1950s, the number of houses doubled, most of which were built in suburbs. Many Americans now realize dreams of owning their own home by purchasing an inexpensive house in a housing development. But suburbs were often centered around malls which were accessible by cars and were used only for shopping and other private activities, unlike city centers with multiple uses. California best symbolized the post-war suburban boom. Between World War II and 1975, more than 30 million Americans moved west of the Mississippi River. One-fifth of the 1950s population growth happened in California, and in 1963, it surpassed New York as the most populous state. Centerless western cities emerged such as Houston, Phoenix, and L.A., these were decentralized clusters of single-family homes and businesses tied together by highways, unlike eastern cities with central business districts and surrounding residential areas united by public transportation. In the new suburbs, life was revolved around the car. People drove to work and drove to shop, and older city centers stagnated. Suburban homes required lawns, so much so that today more land area in the United States is cultivated in grass than in agricultural crops.
Affluence and consumerism had never before so pervaded American society. In a consumer culture, freedom became the ability to satisfy market desires. The 1950s was the culmination of a long-term trend in which consumerism replaced economic independence and democratic participation as central definitions of American freedom. Americans now happily accumulated debt in order to maintain a consumer lifestyle. Television especially spread the culture of middle-class life and consumerism. By 1960, almost all American families owned a TV set, and television replaced newspapers as the most common information source about public events. TV became the nation's primary leisure activity. It changed Americans' habits and offered Americans of all backgrounds a common experience. TV programming almost always avoided controversy and depicted a humdrum middle-class existence. Early TV shows that featured urban working-class families fell to later quiz shows. Westerns and comedies set in suburbia, such as Leave it to Beaver. TV also became the most effective advertising medium ever, selling goods and spreading an image of the good life as one based on consumer goods. Buying a new car seemed essential to freedom, and along with the home and TV, a car became a consumer necessity for each family. By 1960, four of five families in the United States owned at least one car, almost always made in the United States. Auto manufacturers and oil companies became the top companies in America. Detroit became the center of the auto industry, sporting enormous factories with 40,000 or more employees. The car transformed American life. The interstate highway system changed Americans' traveling habits, enabling long-distance vacations by car. The result was an altered landscape of motels, drive-ins, strip malls, movie theaters, and roadside restaurants, including fast food enterprises like McDonald's. The car was an icon of American freedom, representing individual mobility and private choice. Suburbanization reinforced the family as the center of the American way of life and women's household roles. Most women who had industrial jobs during the war lost them, and most women who worked outside the home remained in low-paying, non-union jobs rather than better-paid factory jobs. Although the number of women at work slowly rose, more women worked to supplement their family's consumer lifestyle than for economic independence, and their pay in 1960 was on average 60% of men's pay. It was widely assumed that the suburban family's breadwinner should be male, while the wife stayed at home. Popular culture depicted marriage as the most important life goal of the American woman, and women married younger, divorced less, and had more children. A baby boom lasted from the war's end to the mid-1960s, contributing to 30 million increase in the nation's population in the 1950s. And the family became a weapon in the Cold War, as government officials argued that women's confinement to the home separated the free world from the communist world, where women worked. Feminism seemed to have disappeared from American life and culture. The suburbs offered the dream of home ownership and security to millions of Americans who had suffered through depression and war. It also promoted Americanization, as ethnic Americans left urban enclaves and joined the America of mass consumption. But the suburbs were racially segregated. Although they differed in many ways, suburbs were most always white. The racial segregation of suburbanization was the result of decisions by the government, real estate developers, banks, and residents. <clears throat> in the post-war housing boom, government officials insured mortgages that barred resale to non-whites, and when this was declared unconstitutional, private banks and developers continued the practice. Although Congress, in 1949, passed a law to build almost a million units of public housing, the law set a very low ceiling on residents' income in order to limit competition from the construction of middle-class housing on behalf of private contractors. This limited housing projects to the very poor. Along with the fact that white urban and suburban neighborhoods opposed the construction of public housing, this reinforced the poverty of urban non-white areas. Urban renewal also demolished poor neighborhoods and city centers in order to develop shopping centers, all white middle-income residential areas, and state university campuses. Whites displaced by urban renewal often moved to suburbs, while non-whites were unable to leave the inner city. Suburbanization reinforced racial divisions in America. Between 1950 and 1970, about 7 million whites left cities for suburbs, while 3 million blacks moved from the south to the north, expanding and creating urban ghettos. Half a million Puerto Ricans, many of them small farmers and laborers, pushed off the island by sugar companies, moved to the mainland, and many settled in New York City. Racial exclusion reinforced itself. Non-whites facing employment discrimination and exclusion from educational opportunity were confined to unskilled jobs.
As whites and industrial jobs moved out of the cities, poor blacks and Latinos stayed in the urban ghettos and became seen as centers of crime, poverty, and welfare. Suburban whites feared that any non-white presence in their neighborhoods would lower their quality of life and their property values. In the 1950s, to many it seemed that America's major social problems had been solved. Widespread affluence and narrow political debate made for a quiescent society. Business booms and busts, mass employment, and economic security seemed things of the past. Scholars celebrated the end of ideology and the victory of a democratic capitalist consensus in which all Americans, except a few fanatics, shared the same liberal values of individualism, respect for private property, and belief in equal opportunity. The only problems that might remain required only technical adjustments, not structural change. Religious differences now seemed absorbed into a common Judeo-Christian heritage in which Catholics, Protestants, and Jews all shared history and values and contributed to American society, and freedom of religion was held to it to differentiate America from the anti-religious Soviet Union. Although the Judeo-Christian concept obscured the long-standing history of religious strife in American life, it reflected the decline of anti-Catholicism and anti-Semitism in the United States and increasing secularization in the nation. Although a majority of Americans were affiliated with a church or synagogue in the 1950s, the highest proportion in American history, religion had more to do with personal identity, group assimilation, and promoting traditional morality more than spiritual activity. Cold War freedom's economic content became centered on consumer capitalism, or free enterprise. An economic system based on private ownership united the nations of the free world more than political democracy or freedom of speech. Even President Truman dropped freedom from want and fear from his speeches and replaced them with freedom of enterprise. The selling of free enterprise became a major industry that involved advertising, school programs, newspaper editorials, and civic activities. Yet talk of the virtue of free markets ignored how government policies like federal tax subsidies, mortgage guarantees, infrastructure construction, military contracts, and GI Bill benefits all spurred post-war economic growth. Although Americans had long worried that big business threatened their liberties, they were now told by government officials to embrace large-scale production as a way to fight the Cold War and enhance freedom by spreading consumer goods. Freedom was defined essentially as freedom of choice for the consumer. To many, America seemed to have become a classless society. A steep rise in the number of people investing in Wall Street inspired talk of a people's capitalism. Few could deny that affluence seemed to make poverty a relic of history. In the 1950s, a few intellectuals began to revive conservatism and reclaim from liberals the idea of freedom. Their ideas eventually defined conservative thought for the rest of the 20th century. Their opposition to a strong national government was fostered by resentments against the New Deal. These libertarian conservatives defined freedom as individual autonomy, limited government, and unregulated capitalism. Their principles appealed to conservative entrepreneurs, especially in the developing South and West. Many businessmen looking to earn profits free of government regulations, high taxes, and unions admired the writings of Milton Friedman. A young economist, Friedman, in 1962, published Capitalism and Freedom, which identified the free market as the foundation of individual liberty. Friedman gave this rather popular idea an extreme logic. He called for privatizing almost all government functions and for the repeal of minimum wage laws, the graduated income tax, and Social Security. Friedman criticized not only liberalism, but the new conservatism, another growing body of 1950s thought. Believing that the free world had to be morally and intellectually, and not just militarily, defended against communism, writers like Russell Kirk and Richard Weaver argued that liberals' toleration of difference was no substitute for the search for absolute truth. They called for a return to a civilization based on Christian values. They understood freedom as a moral condition above all, in which individuals were responsible for their own actions and could be coerced by government if they did not make the right decisions. Although the libertarian conservatives and the new conservatives disagreed about priorities and the definition of freedom, they both united against the Soviet Union and liberalism at home. Conservatism in America was now defined by its opposition to big government. Chapter 24, Part 2 Dwight D. Eisenhower, known as Ike, was the most popular military leader to emerge from World War II. Eisenhower supported Truman's candidacy for president in 1948 and in 1952. Both parties wanted Eisenhower as their candidate. But Eisenhower believed that a contender for the Republican nomination, Senator Robert A. Taft of Ohio, would turn America back to isolationism, and Eisenhower gained the Republican nomination. He chose as his running mate, Richard Nixon of California, 
who was a member of the House Un-American Activities Committee, had achieved notoriety through his anti-communism activism, particularly against Alger Hiss. Nixon won a Senate seat in 1950 by suggesting that his Democratic opponent sympathized with communism. Though Nixon thus gained a reputation for opportunism and dishonesty, he also was a skillful politician who led efforts to change the Republican Party's image from defender of business to champion of the forgotten man, hard-working citizens burdened by heavy taxes and government bureaucracy. The 1952 presidential campaign was the first to show how television changed politics as candidates crafted images that were projected directly into Americans' living rooms. Eisenhower's popularity dominated the election, however, and public frustration with the Korean War and Eisenhower's pledge to bring peace won him an overwhelming victory over Adlai Stevenson, the Democrats' candidate. Four years later, Eisenhower again bested Stevenson by an even larger margin. But the Republicans did not gain power in Congress, and in 1954, the Democrats regained control of Congress and held it for the rest of the 1950s. Voters across the world elected familiar and elder leaders to govern them, such as Winston Churchill, made Prime Minister in England again, and Charles de Gaulle in France. With the Republican president, after a long period of Democratic rule, business once again heavily influenced Washington and the executive branch. Ike, an ally of business and fiscal conservatism worked to reduce government spending, including the military budget. But while some Republicans wanted to roll back the New Deal, Ike knew this would be political suicide. Ike's domestic agenda, called modern republicanism, was intended to end the Republicans' association with Herbert Hoover, the Great Depression, and social indifference. Under Eisenhower, New Deal programs expanded and the size of the government grew. Free enterprise may have been a potent American weapon in the Cold War, but the mixed economy, in which government played a role in planning economic activity, was popular in the West. U.S. allies like Britain and France expanded welfare and nationalized key industries like steel, shipbuilding, and transportation. But the U.S. had a smaller welfare state than Western Europe and left major industries in private hands, while government spending, such as the creation of a national highway system, boosted productivity and employment. The 1950s also saw stability in labor relations. The 1947 Taft-Hartley Act reduced labor militants, and in 1955, the AFL and CIO merged into one organization, representing 35% of all non-farm workers. In key industries, labor and management established what has been called a new social contract. Unions left decisions about capital investment, plant location, and output to managers and agreed to suppress unauthorized wildcat strikes in return for employers' acceptance of unions, wage increases, and fringe benefits like private pensions, health insurance, and automatic adjustments to cover rises in living costs. Though unionized workers shared in 1950s prosperity, the social contract applied to few workers. Unions won increases in the minimum wage, but they did little for non-union workers in this period. Most workers did not enjoy the wages and benefits of union workers. Non-union employers continued to combat labor unions, and some firms still moved production to the cheaper, non-union South. A 1959 strike provoked by steel companies in an attempt to reduce the union's power over production showed that by the 1960s, the social contract was weakening. Once elected, Eisenhower quickly ended the Korean War, but Cold War tensions increased. In 1952, the United States exploded the first hydrogen bomb, which was far more destructive than the atom bomb. The next year, the Soviets had the hydrogen bomb too, and both powers built long-range bombers capable of delivering nuclear weapons across the globe. Although Eisenhower was a professional soldier who hated war, his Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, relished it. In 1954, Dulles updated U.S. containment policy with his doctrine of massive retaliation. This policy stated that any Soviet attack on a U.S. ally would be met with a nuclear assault on the Soviet Union. This new focus on nuclear weapons let Eisenhower reduce spending on conventional military forces. During his presidency, the size of the armed forces dropped, while the number of nuclear weapons increased dramatically to 18,000. Massive retaliation seemed a risk that even a small conflict might rapidly escalate into a nuclear war that would destroy the U.S. and the Soviet Union. Critics called it brinksmanship, but the reality that war would result in a mutual assured destruction made the U.S. and the USSR more cautious. It also spread fear of an imminent nuclear war. Government appeals to build bomb shelters in backyards and school drills where students hid under their desks were meant to convince Americans that they could survive a nuclear war, but these only increased widespread fears. Though Eisenhower embraced Cold War rhetoric, he believed the Korean War's end and Stalin's death in 1953 signaled that the Soviets were reasonable and could be reached through normal diplomacy.
In 1955, he met with Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev in Switzerland. The next year, Khrushchev denounced Stalin's crimes at a Moscow Communist Party Congress. These revelations sparked a crisis of belief and confidence in communists worldwide, including the United States, where most remaining members of the Communist Party abandoned it. That same year, Khrushchev called for peaceful coexistence with the United States. But this thaw in the Cold War ended when Soviet troops suppressed an anti-communist revolt in Hungary. While some Republicans called for liberating Europe, Ike did not aid the Hungarian rebels. He did not believe it was possible to roll back Soviet power in Eastern Europe. In 1958, the United States and USSR agreed to halt nuclear weapons tests. This only lasted until 1961. In 1959, Khrushchev even toured the U.S. and met with Eisenhower. But in 1960, tensions returned when the Soviets shot down a U.S. spy plane over Soviet territory. Even though the Cold War permanently divided Europe into communist and capitalist regions without war, it sparked competition and military conflict in what came to be called the Third World. The term was used to describe developing countries aligned with neither the U.S. or the USSR, which wanted to develop their economies without central government planning or free market capitalism. The 1955 Bandung Conference in Indonesia that brought together the leaders of 29 African and Asian nations seemed to mark the arrival of the Third World in international affairs. But all of these countries were strongly affected by the Cold War. In the post-war period, Europe's empires crumbled. Decolonization in Asia and Africa began when India and Pakistan achieved independence in 1947. In the late 1950s, other new nations, such as Ghana, Indonesia, Malaysia, Nigeria, and Kenya followed. In 1975, even Portugal, which had created Europe's first modern overseas empire, gave independence to its African colonies, Mozambique and Angola. Facing decolonization, the United States feared that power vacuums in the former colonies would be penetrated by Soviet-allied communists. The Soviets supported the dissolution of Europe's colonial empires, and communists participated in national movements for independence. Leaders of new nations often saw socialism in one form or another as the best means to economic independence and narrowing social inequalities created by imperialism. While most third world nations sided with neither power, the U.S. was admired by many nationalists for its very own struggle for colonial independence. Ho Chi Minh, the communist leader of Vietnam's movement to end French rule there, modeled his 1945 Declaration of Nationhood on the Declaration of Independence. Containment policy soon created U.S. opposition to any government, whether communist or not, which appeared to threaten U.S. strategic or economic interests. Although Jacob Arbenz Guzman in Guatemala and Mohamed Mossadegh in Iran were elected as homegrown nationalists and were not Soviet agents, their determination to end foreign corporations' domination of their economies provoked American intervention. Arbenz enacted land reforms that threatened the domination of the Guatemalan economy by the U.S.-owned United Fruit Company. Mossadegh nationalized the Anglo-Iranian oil company, whose refinery in Iran was Britain's largest overseas asset. Their enemies branded them as communists, and in 1953 and 1954, the CIA orchestrated coups against both governments in violation of the UN Charter. In 1956, Israel, Britain, and France invaded Egypt when that country's nationalist leader, Gamal Abdel Nasser, nationalized the Suez Canal, which had been owned by Britain and France. Eisenhower forced them to abandon the invasion, and soon the United States replaced Britain as the dominant Western power in the Middle East, with American firms dominating the region's oil fields. In 1957, Eisenhower extended containment policy to the Middle East and issued the Eisenhower Doctrine, which committed the United States to defend Middle Eastern governments threatened by communism or Arab nationalism. In Vietnam in 1945, when the Japanese were expelled, the French moved to crush a national independence movement led by Ho Chi Minh and reassert its colonial rule. Anti-communism pulled the United States deeper into involvement in Southeast Asia. Following a policy set by Truman, Eisenhower gave billions of dollars in aid for French efforts, and by the early 1950s, the United States was paying for four-fifths of the cost of France war in Vietnam. But Eisenhower did not send U.S. troops in 1954, when French forces were on the verge of defeat. Rejecting National Security Council advice to use nuclear weapons, Eisenhower left France no choice but to concede Vietnamese independence. A peace conference in Geneva divided Vietnam temporarily into northern and southern districts, with elections in 1956 set to unify the country. But the anti-communist southern leader Ngo Dinh Diem, at the suggestion of the United States, refused to hold elections, which both parties knew would result in communist victory.
Diem's Catholicism and his ties to landlords and a country of small farmers and Buddhists alienated him from many Vietnamese, and only U.S. aid let his regime survive. By 1960, Diem faced a guerrilla war launched by the communist-led National Liberation Front. Events in Guatemala, Iran, and Vietnam set a trend for U.S. foreign relations. The United States became accustomed to intervention, both overt and covert, throughout the world. Despite Cold War language of freedom, U.S. leaders again and again allied with military regimes rather than democratic governments. In Guatemala, a series of military regimes ended Arbenz's for reforms and began a period of repression in which about 200,000 Guatemalans died. In Iran, the Shah replaced Mossadegh and gave U.S. and British companies 40% of Iranian oil revenues, remaining in office until the 1979 revolution ushered in a radical Islamic nationalist government. In Vietnam, U.S. support for Diem led to the most disastrous war in U.S. history. Despite the apparent rule of consensus in American society, in which McCarthyism made criticism of the status quo seem disloyal, in which freedom seemed to be located in the private enjoyment of consumer goods, and in which political debate was narrowed by the Cold War, dissent did exist. Some intellectuals thought that affluence in the Cold War mentality obscured the degree to which the United States did not live up to its own ideal of freedom. In 1957, political scientist Hans Morgenthau argued that free enterprise had created new accumulations of power that threatened individual liberty. Radical sociologist C. Wright Mills challenged the idea that democratic pluralism defined American life and argued that America was ruled by a power elite, an interlocking directorate of corporate leaders, politicians, and military men who dominated government and society, making political democracy obsolete and denying real freedom of choice to Americans. Some argued that modernity itself produced psychological and cultural discontent, and they worried that mass society produced the loneliness and anxiety that made people desire not freedom, but authority and stability. Social scientists and critics argued that Americans were conformists who were unable to be independent thinkers and actors, and that corporate bureaucracies turned employees into organization men, incapable of independent thought. Other critics worried that Americans had lost their commitment to the common good. A common economist, John Kenneth Galbraith, in The Affluent Society in 1958, wondered how American society could neglect investment in schools, parks, and public services while producing ever more goods to satisfy consumer desires. Other books criticized the monotony of modern work, the emptiness of suburban life, and the influence of advertising, but this social and cultural critique did little to transform American life in the 1950s. These critics did not offer a political alternative or influence party politics or government, but with a very large and growing young population thanks to the baby boom, Pop culture revealed tensions beneath the quiet surface of 1950s life. J.D. Salinger's novel, Catcher in the Rye, in 1951, and films like Rebel Without a Cause in 1955, emphasized the alienation of youth from the adult world. Such works stimulated adult fears of widespread juvenile delinquency and led even comic book publishers to regulate their publications. Indeed, cultural life was more daring than politics. Teenagers wore leather jackets and danced to rock and roll music that brought hard rhythms and sexually provocative movements of black musicians and dancers to white audiences, embodied none more so than an extremely popular Elvis Presley. The debut of magazines like Playboy openly flaunted a fantasy world of sexuality for men outside the family and gay men and lesbians, though considered deviant by the larger society, established their own subcultures in America's major cities. In New York, San Francisco, and small college towns, the Beats, a small group of poets and writers, rebelled against mainstream culture. The term beat, invented by novelist Jack Kerouac, signified beaten down and beatified, or saint-like. His book On the Road, written in the early 1950s but not published until 1957, captured the aimless wanderings of the main character across America in a spontaneous series of sights, sounds, and images. The book captivated a generation of young people who rejected middle-class life but offered no alternative to it. Likewise, Allen Ginsberg's Howl in 1955, written while the author was taking hallucinogenic drugs, was a sprawling poem that railed against materialism and conformism. The Beats rejected the work ethic, suburban middle class materialism, and the Cold War's militarization of American life. They celebrated impulsive action, immediate gratification, often enhanced by drugs, and sexual experimentation.